possible to write tests that cover all possible circumstances, that cover all the different things that could go wrong. It's all about designing for, for what you can imagine and what you can think about, which is no different in the experimental world from having a good set of controls, about knowing that your instrument is behaving the way it should be, of running the kinds of calibrations, processes, putting the subject in the right place in the MRI machine that ensure that things are going to work for you. So in a sense, it's kind of interesting from my perspective that as an experimental scientist, I always looked at com computational science and thought, you know, you guys have got it easy. I mean, you build this software and you know it's going to be work every time. You know that the data's reliable. You know that these things are all in the right place. Um, and you know, everything's going to, going to continue to work in exactly the same way every time you run it, right? Yeah, that's what computers do. And then I met these computational scientists who kept, kept saying to me, you know, you experimental scientists really do this properly. You know, your standards of publication are all about reproducibility, all about making sure that someone else can come along and repeat your experiment. And of course, many of you will have seen the paper in Nature a couple of months ago where a group of people from Amgen took primary research results that were of interest to them as a drug development company. And their first step in taking these potential drug targets down the road of development was, of course, to check they could reproduce these experiments published in you know, those kind of middling, barely reliable journals like Nature and Science. they could replicate the experiment in about 12% of cases. This is slightly problematic. And, of course, many of you will know some of the horror stories from computational science of things that cannot be replicated, code that cannot be recovered, code that cannot be run. So it's very interesting that we've got the situation where the grass appears to be greener on both sides of the fence. So what I want to suggest is essentially that actually both camps can draw inspiration from the best practice on the other side of that fence. So when we talk about the best practice in experimental science, we talk very much about reproducibility, of providing the detail of exactly what reagents were used, how the experiment was run, recording the conditions, telling someone about the calibration, we talk a lot about the documentation, how detailed that needs to be, and it's always more detailed than you think, to make it possible for someone to have a fair to even chance of actually taking your experimental results and repeating them. And those are things that, at least anecdotally, are not done terribly well in the majority of the computational sciences. People don't tell you a lot about the dependencies. They very often don't provide the code, certainly very often don't provide the source code that would enable you to reproduce things, and probably the less said about documentation, the better. On the other hand, we have these truly amazing tools in computational science. So we have things like continuous integration, the notion that every time you check in a piece of code, every time you add a piece of code to a system, to a whole body, perhaps to the work of a whole group, you don't just run the tests on that code and make sure that they pass. You recompile the entire set of code with all of its dependencies. You identify all the places where it breaks. You find all of the things that could go wrong, but this person who's added another two lines, or maybe taken away ten lines, has potentially broken. Imagine if we could do that with the research literature. Imagine as an editor or a referee, you have this paper come in, you're looking at it and you're not entirely convinced. You're a bit worried because this is perhaps going to upset, it, upset the apple cart may, or maybe it confirms things and you don't want it confirmed. I can't imagine that happening. But, but one can imagine that that could be possible. But if you could just run the paper or compile the paper against the rest of the world's literature, against the data from the rest of the world's literature, and be able to see if this were true, what would that mean about this, the rest of this literature? What would it mean we have to reassess? What would it mean we have to look at? 
And imagine you had that capability from the perspective of a researcher coming in to a new space trying to understand which papers you need to trust and which ones you need to keep clear of, whether it's in terms of the methodology, in terms of the data, um, or in terms of the conclusion. So I think there's these, there are lots of these parallels, and I could draw this out by talking about lots and lots of different examples. Um, source code, you know, subversion, um, continuous integration is a great example. Um, on the experimental side, I say running controls properly, good documentation, but also things about how we effectively share results, how in the end it often becomes important to bring someone into a lab to teach them how to actually run a process in a way that's very similar to the reasons why pair programming is an effective mechanism for identifying issues in code. And what I want to suggest is that actually these are not analogies, they're not similarities, they're actually expressions of a deeper underlying similarity that these are both fundamentally today information businesses. They are systems in which we take data and process and draw conclusions from them and that in both cases systems of provenance, systems of labelling, and tagging and integration are critical and that in the both areas of science we don't do a terribly good job of that in either case. That raises some interesting questions. If these are systems, information systems, then what's the platform are we building on? Are those platforms stable? Are they reliable? What are the dependencies for the peer review process? What are the dependencies for code that runs only in Fortran 77? What are the dependencies of the code that's written in Python, although it's actually written in Fortran? How many of you have seen, I came across a wonderful example of this. I couldn't understand this code at all. I figured actually it was someone writing Fortran in Python. Um, which is what happens when you take a Fortran programmer and tell them they have to use Python who has been writing in Fortran for 30 years. They think about the problem in a different way. It creates all sorts of interesting dependencies. So there's lots of, lots of different things to mine there. But what I want to pick on and what I think will be picked up by the other speakers is to go back to some of the things that John Udell focuses on when he talks about web thinking. Because John Udell's web thinking and computational thinking and all of these things are effectively an expression, again, of the same thing that we are all in the business of managing data and information and the processing of that data. And in this context, John says a couple of things that I think are really important. And probably the most important, and the thing which we're f really failing to translate into the world of science, is to copy by reference, not by value. That sounds like an abstruse kind of thing. What does it matter whether I go through some torturous process of linking this cell in that spreadsheet back to that other cell in that other spreadsheet of building a workflow versus the easy thing, which is just copying and pasting? And the answer is that we lose the provenance. And in losing the provenance, we lose the opportunities for integration. So when we talk about things that sound dull, like data citation, like URLs for objects, whether they be people or papers or physical reagents or data, and when we talk about the process of linking them up and really dull things like W3C standards and ontologies and all of these things, I know I'm preaching to the choir here in practice, but the bottom line is that all of these things are links and addresses. And in linking and addressing things and copying by reference, we start the slow process of working towards a world where continuous integration for the scientific literature will be an assumed part of what we do. It will be the basis for how we think about 
connecting and communicating our research before we think about submitting it to a journal or sharing it with anyone else. And it will be the basis for how we assure ourselves that what we've done is up to standard. Because at the end of the day, the person you mostly collaborate with yourself is mostly collaborate with is yourself in six months' time when you've forgotten what you did. And so the value we can create for ourselves in doing these things properly is enormous. And it's always hard. You know, it's always the thing that you will do tomorrow. I'll do the documentation tomorrow. I'll sort the tests out tomorrow. I'll put the data in the database tomorrow. Because there's always a more important thing to do. But usually it's replying to the referees on the paper that you've already lost the data for. So if we can focus on this notion of ourselves as managing information, of the provenance and linking and citation as the core of that process, then yes, we're going to have to put in some more work, but in six months' time, you're going to appreciate that work. And in five years' time, we're going to have a much better system for managing the information which is already overwhelming us. And I'll stop there and pass on. <laughs>